Hi everyone and welcome to the second episode of the Wrestling Journal. This week we're going to be looking at loads of different subjects. We're going to be reviewing the next wrestler which I will reveal later. More importantly we're going to start with the hot topic of the week. For those of you who don't know what the hot topic of the week is all about, each week we're going to look if there's been a, a controversial subject online, if there's been some sort of conversation taking place on social media about something around wrestling, then I will usually come in and have a little bit of a commentary about said subject. What we've done this week, it's not actually anything to do with something that I saw online. It's more to do with something I posted online from the Wrestling Journal and it's the at Wrestling Journo Twitter account. So you can go ahead and follow that if you're listening. And you can see all these sort of conversation starters that periodically I'm going to throw out each week. Just to sort of get a conversation started. Because what's important to me, while the Wrestling Journal is obviously myself doing reviews and giving my opinion on the business and wrestlers. And we're looking at a, the greatest of all time list. I still want the audience i still want you guys to be interacting with all of this stuff that's going on so after the reviews take place keep the conversation going tell me what you think about the reviews give me examples let me know the good and the bad that you agree with that you disagree with and let's keep that conversation going and that goes for everything we do including things like this and what i wanted to do was ask a question that i've seen online so many times as a wrestling fan, you hear the conversation. It comes up over and over and over again. These wrestlers have been interviewed about it. It's something that everybody always debates. And I just wanted to throw it out there because it was something that I thought would be a really good topic to discuss at the beginning of this week's episode. The question that I've asked is, who is the biggest star to never win a major title in WWE? I did want to stick to WWE. I'm happy to move that over to WCW as well because none of these guys actually won a title in WCW because I was worried about one of them because I thought, actually, has he won the World Heavyweight title? And if I remember correctly, he didn't win the title, but it was teased that he did win it. I'll explain that in a moment when I reveal who it is. So the four options that I had, you're allowed maximum four I don't know why that is on Twitter. Why can't they give you a poll that actually has more than four suggestions? Stupid. And I also don't like the fact that it doesn't really help you in terms of comments and things. It's a great way of getting a conversation started, but it's just not that great at all yet. So Twitter, if you ever listen to this, please change that. Make it more customizable. Give us more options. Make it better for everyone. Also, the character limits are so low, it just makes it almost impossible to actually write anything into... I mean, if you've got a wrestler with a long name, you're forced to shorten it because Twitter doesn't give you the, the character spaces. Anyway, this is me having a rant at Twitter. We won't need to go into that anymore. So the four people in the poll, Mr. Perfect is the first one. Ravishing Rick Rude, couldn't put Ravishing in, so it's just Rick Rude. Jake the Snake Roberts, again, can't get the snake in there, so it's just Jake Roberts. And then Rowdy Roddy Piper. When I look at these four... They all have credible reasons for being in this list, and I think all of them could have arguably won the title. There are a couple of honourable mentions that I want to throw in right now. Owen Hart, British Bulldog. They were two people that I would have also thrown into this ring of wrestlers that just never got the chance to win the major title in, in WWE or even WCW. Now, like I said, one of them, I remember winning or at least having a shot at the world heavyweight title in WCW. If my memory serves me right, Rowdy Roddy Piper was fighting Hulk Hogan for the World Heavyweight title. He had him in a sleeper hold at whatever event it was, and he was going to beat Hogan for the title. And then something happens, like the NWO interfere with the feed, and the screen, the snow effect comes on, and, and you miss the end of the match. And from what I remember, Tony Giovanni and the guys on the commentary booth are like, he was about to win, but we don't know what happened. And then I really can't remember how the storyline goes, but WCW being WCW, they mess it all up. So as far as I'm aware, Roddy Piper didn't win the title, or if he did, it was stripped because it wasn't proven that he actually won it. Who knows what WCW were thinking back in these days. 
They ruined the great storyline and also a great opportunity to give a world title to somebody who deserved it like Rowdy Roddy Piper. That aside, the others are all 100% guys that never won the WE title and or the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. So we've got these group of wrestlers and the poll, we didn't have loads of votes. I'm going to hold my hands up, tell you that right now. We had four votes on this poll, but there was a winner. There was also a wrestler that I was really surprised didn't get a vote at all. And that was Mr. Perfect. He got zero votes. Which surprises me because while he was definitely the, the gate holder when it came to wrestlers going from a mid-card to main event scene in WWF, he was always the guy that opened the gate, let the wrestlers walk through onto the title. We've already discussed the fact that Mr. Perfect had a run for the title against Hulk Hogan. And actually, I looked at the vignettes and they were really good vignettes. Mr. Perfect really did live his gimmick. In the vignettes, he wins at table tennis. It was a ridiculous match of table tennis. Anybody who's played just to a casually good level knows that it was a complete setup for, for Mr. Perfect to win. But at the same time, Mr. Perfect's got some good form with the paddles. He did all right. So they, they did try and push Perfect into the main event scene. And for me, he should have won the title from Hogan, but whether Hogan wanted to, to give it to him, I don't know. Mr. Perfect, it seemed like to me, was primed to win it, and he should have at least held the title once, in my opinion. Ravishing Rick Rude is another guy who, when you look at the match that he had with the Ultimate Warrior, he is a guy who could tell a story with a wrestler that couldn't tell a story, that wasn't technically very good, and had a bad reputation of having short matches and not really knowing how to tell a story from a technical standpoint in the ring. And so Rick Rude for me, and obviously I'm going to review all of these guys at some point, but was one of those guys like Randy Savage who, was, who had this ability to work with anyone and could tell a good story with them. Randy Savage did the same thing with The Ultimate Warrior, a tremendous story told. The Warrior matches for me are very underrated, and I'll go into those whenever we review The Ultimate Warrior, but Rick Rude did a great job and was always, in my opinion, deserving of a title run, I thought, I love heel champions, and I don't think it happens enough nowadays. It always seems to be a hit a face holding the title for years. Not for years, but nowadays it's like months. I miss it. I miss the days of having good heels winning the title, and you just want them to lose. But they keep winning because they either cheat or they get out of it. Like, I love those cowardly heels. There's something about them that really attracts me to then want to support the face that's going to fight them and ultimately win the title. So I miss that. And Rick Rude was a great example of one of those wrestlers who could just sell and do everything he needed to. The next wrestler on the list would be Roddy Piper. He is joint second, gets 25% of the vote as well. People don't give Roddy the credit he deserves. We're talking about the guy who was the heel to Hogan's face when Hulk Hogan blew up and when WrestleMania became WrestleMania and when wrestling became Hollywood. Hogan without Piper would never become the Hulk Hogan that we know today. I'm not going to ever debate that with anyone because I just believe it within my being that Roddy Piper was the one who caused all of the heat. He was the one who drew all of the attention. He was the one who got all the hate and it meant that you just wanted Hogan to beat him. Everything that was directed towards Hogan, all the popularity came because Roddy Piper was hated. And even if you didn't like Hogan, you wanted to support him because of who he was fighting. And Roddy Piper, to me, was one of, if not the best heel in the wrestling business, period. So for me, it just made sense that he, at some point, would hold the world title. It just made sense. I never thought he was a good wrestler, but he just had everything he needed to pass it off as being a champion. I can't imagine how great he would have been if he'd have held the WF title. He just would have gone on to another level, and it's such a travesty that he knew he was never given it. The next wrestler, and the winner of the poll, 
is Jake the Snake Roberts with two votes, 50% of the vote. So for Jake the Snake, and I'll I'll go into the other two wrestlers shortly and explain why they're the honourable mentions, but for Jake the Snake, he wins this poll, and I voted for Jake Roberts. I Again, you can't vote on your own polls, which I think is stupid on Twitter, and yet another rant that I've got for another day with the Twitter bosses, but when it comes to Jake the Snake Roberts, to me, the epitome of ring psychology, promo psychology, Drew Heat, could just make you hate him. Like, just had this way of making you want to choke him to death yourself. Even as a fan, you just wanted to get at him and give him a clothesline. And that's... Him and Roddy Piper were like that. Rick Rude was a little bit behind in that sense, but Rude was a better wrestler, in my opinion, than Roberts and Piper. So that's where Rude and Perfect, that's where those two really balance it out. But Jake Roberts should have got a title run. In WF, he should have won the title at some point. I think for him, it seemed like timing. From from me running back in my head, the history of WF, it always seemed like Jake Roberts was a victim of bad timing. He was in the right place at the wrong time. And that was a shame because it always meant that he was never quite ready to be put into the main event scene because he was always trying to put other people over who were sort of coming through. And yet he was also never really given good intercontinental title runs either. I mean, Roberts was just a, an anomaly for me in, in WE. Just a really weird, deserved so much more than he got. But he was so good on the mic. He sold stories really well. He's one of those guys who didn't need a title run because he was so good anyway. And it's a testament to each of these individuals that they didn't have a title run, yet they're still considered some of the top legends and top wrestlers of all time. And I think that speaks volumes about who they were, their body of work as wrestlers. But I would have loved to see Jake Roberts win a title. In my WE universe on my computer games that I, whenever I run like my booking mode, it's called universe mode, but it's essentially a booking mode. Jake Roberts is always given a title run for me all the time. He will be the first guy that I give the belt to because he deserves it. And I think his promos were so good. His psychology was so good that he just made a really good champion. And I can't believe he was never given the title. But with all that said, the honourable mentions are Owen Hart and the British Bulldog. Obviously, Owen and British Bulldog gone way too soon. Bulldog had his issues. We understand a little bit more that, you know, he had the chance to run with the IC title at SummerSlam 92. Drug problems, nerves, all the things that Bulldog had just played against him. And I can at least understand with Bulldog why the WF decided against Bulldog being a WF champion. He just didn't have what it took. I don't think he had the strength of personal character to hold the belt and run with the ball. It was obvious that he would have fallen apart at the seams the second he got the title and wasn't very good at winning belts, which is a real key factor in all of this. Bulldog almost messed up that match. If it hadn't have been for Bret Hart, that match would have been an absolute joke. And Bret pulled Bulldog through it, made it credible, People loved it, and that says a lot about Bret Hart and how good he is and why he was such a great champion and wrestler. Owen Hart, again, left far too soon. I was watching the Dark Side of the Ring documentary about Owen Hart last week, and there were a few things, a few points that were brought up that made sense, which was Owen didn't care about the business as much as Bret. And that's not to say he didn't love wrestling, it's just to say that He didn't take it as seriously as Brett did. And so he didn't really have the same level of ambition as Brett Hart did. He was an ambitious guy, but he didn't have that level of, I want to be the best in the business and I want to be recognized as the best ever. Brett had that. And you could see it in all of his moves, the way that he sold psychology in the ring. Everything Brett did meant something. With Owen Hart, you could see that there was more enjoyment. He was doing stuff because he just wanted to do it. He just wanted to try different moves. The Insegiri kicks, all of the things that he would do just look more fun. And he was a much more high-flying wrestler because of that. And I think that's why he resonated with fans. They were entertained by him. But the problem was, because he didn't have that serious edge to him, he was never seen as a credible title holder. For me, if I could go back and fantasy book, 
I would have made Owen Hart the WWE champion directly after WrestleMania 10 when he beats Bret Hart, but before Bret is the champion. Owen should have challenged him, and I maybe did this because I haven't watched the following pay-per-view or anything like that, although I know there's the cage match that is a really good match that Owen and Bret have. For me, I would have given the title to Owen at that point. I would have had a trilogy of matches where Owen would have won the title the very next night or the next event, not pay-per-view. It would have been on TV. It would have just been a complete shock. Owen Hart would have beaten Bret Hart for the title. He would have kept going after Bret's leg and he would have just upset Bret and won. WrestleMania 10, I would have let Bret win. But Bret would have been the guy who sort of beat Owen with this awkward pin. And I know that some people will say, yeah, but the point was, was that Brett lost and then his confidence was down and then he was injured with his leg again. And that all led into him winning the title at the end of the night. But for me, there was a way that you could get around that. Owen would injure Brett after the match. Brett would beat Owen Hart in a really sort of sneaky and smart way. Maybe it's a roll up, maybe it's a small package, whatever it is. Brett steals the win from Owen. And Owen is so mad that he just goes off on Brett's leg. And after the match, smashes him up, damages his leg. And so Brett is then injured for the main event. Owen, out of his anger, demands a rematch because he feels like he was outsmarted, blah, blah, blah. Owen would then win that second match. And everyone would know that he's only beaten Brett because Brett was injured. And Owen is obviously the person who's done all the damage. And knowing that Brett had also gone through a match with Yokozuna. So there's this believable angle where Owen Hart could actually win the title. And I think at this point, him being the King of Hearts, it would have just played brilliantly into Owen's character. I would have loved to have seen him take the title. The same as all of the other guys that I've mentioned. Because they would have gone on to a different level in their character. Naturally, it would have elevated them to a plane that they've never been on before. It's amazing what happens when you say to somebody, we want you to carry the ball for the whole company. And it is amazing when you give them that challenge, when you give them that pressure, that a lot of people, especially in wrestling, and especially the guys I've listed, except for the Bulldog, all of the others would have taken that ball and they would have done something with it. I've got no doubt in my mind. And I think all of us would have benefited throughout wrestling history because of that. So that's how I would have done it with Owen But I felt like because Owen's career was cut short, it wasn't right to put him on the poll. But it was definitely right to mention him as somebody who definitely deserved to hold the WF title at some point. Okay, so that is the end of the hot topic. One thing I do want to just say, because it came in this morning online, just a sad heart that I have to say this, but big condolences, prayers and thoughts go out to the family of Road Warrior Animal, obviously, He passed away um, or was announced as being dead this morning online through his Twitter account. And that was just really sad for me because, you know, as I'm sure many of you listening have also experienced, the Road Warriors were just such a big influence on the WE in sort of the late 80s, early 90s. And it was those characters that really rounded out the product of what WWF was, especially for me as someone from the UK. We loved the Road Warriors. They had the cushions. You remember the famous Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Big Boss Man, Road Warrior cushions that you could buy. I mean, they were just huge in the UK. And the Road Warriors were really seen as one of the big powerhouses of wrestling. They were just, they had that charisma that you couldn't help but love. Even though they weren't that great as wrestlers individually. And we'll talk about them as a tag team and individuals at some point in the wrestling journal but for me they were just an astounding tag team and that's something that when it comes to tag team wrestling it's different to everything else singles wrestling there's charisma with your opponent right but in tag team wrestling you have to have chemistry i think i just said charisma what i mean was chemistry with not only with your opponents but with your tag team partner and that is really what makes a tag team great that's what to me divides the greatest tag teams of all time with the rest of the tag team divisions. It's all about the chemistry that you have with your partner. And it's there's something that changes within tag team wrestling where fans will feed off of the chemistry of the two wrestlers. They'll watch two people going at it and you feed off of that. 
But when it comes to tag team wrestling, there seems to be this extra element where fans need chemistry between the tag team itself before they can believe and get involved and feel attached to the match. It's a weird thing with tag team wrestling, but it's there, it exists. If you look at all of the tag teams, the greatest tag teams throughout history, every one of them, without doubt, has chemistry with each other before anything else. And then on top of that, you then get the greatest rivalries that come out of it because there are chemistry between the teams. For the next part of the show, what we're going to do is we're going to go into critique of the review that I did in the last episode. So it'll be a real quick one. We're just going to quickly look at Kevin Nash, who was the subject of last week's review. If you haven't heard it, go and have a look at that episode. We talk about Kevin Nash. We go into his career. We reveal several matches that I watched, promos that I've watched that I think are worth watching in order to review who Kevin Nash was as a wrestler, his overall ranking in the greatest of all time list, his rating out of 100. We look at all of that stuff and we go into depth on it all. It's a really good look into who Kevin Nash was. So I I definitely recommend that you go back and have a look at that. For those of you who don't want to, can't be bothered, that's fine. Let's have a quick look now at the score that I gave Kevin Nash. So the score that I actually gave Big Sexy last time was a 93 out of 100. He had a 21 for character, 21 for physique, 20 mic skills, 19 for technique. He was all threes on the other four areas, a 93 overall, and the 15th top wrestler of all time. The biggest thing that I looked at with Kevin Nash after last week's episode, there's for me there was a big debate over his physique. Is he a 22 or is he a 21? And also his mic skills, is he a 20 or is he a 19? And they, they were the biggest areas of contention for me. His physique, he's not a 22 because of the injuries that he had and the fact that there was no way Kevin Nash is going for a match that's over 25 minutes and staying in the match believably and credibly. He would have blown out. You could always see that he was blown up in matches after a, a, a good run and We all know that he had knee problems. For me, it just made sense that Kevin Nash, while he looked the part, he didn't play the part physically all the time. So he couldn't be given the perfect score. And with Mike's skills, we looked at him being a 20, which at first I felt was too high after I re-reviewed it. I talked to a friend about it after and he sent me some bad promos from Kevin Nash and I was like, maybe I should drop this down. And I did, but... Something I've said on this podcast in the first episode is that we're only looking at the peak of their career. I'm not bothered if they've had bad promos because everybody has a bad promo. If you're getting into wrestling, if you're doing anything, uh, I've done a lot of public speaking in my time and I've spoken in front of large crowds and the first couple of times that you do it at least, there's a massive learning curve that you have to go on and you do not deliver the best communication. You just don't do it right. There's always things that you make mistakes on. There's always parts that you look back on and you review it in your head and you're like, man, I regret doing that. And that happens with everyone. So we have to remember that everybody has a bad day. Everybody does something that's bad and that's laughable and embarrassing. And that's okay. The key is consistency and what are they like at their peak. And Kevin Nash at his peak was one of the reasons that wrestling became the mammoth and popularized sport that it became in the late 90s. It's one of the main reasons that we even have a sport today that's got a big fan base. So for that reason, Nash stays the same. His overall is 93, still the 15th top wrestler in the list. I've actually reviewed a couple of other wrestlers on my list as well. I've just been watching wrestling, and then when you see the opponents, I've jumped in, watched other matches, and I reviewed them. There are wrestlers that are around about the 15 mark in the rankings, but somehow Kevin Nash has managed to stay where he was, so it's all good. I'm definitely happy with the score that I gave Kevin last time, and I'll stand by that. But like I said before, earlier in the show, if you want to talk to me about this, if you want to 
Come back at me with some ideas if you want to make suggestions of why you agree or disagree with the scores I've given Kevin Nash or any other wrestler on the show that we do. This is your chance to do it. Hashtag The Wrestling Journal on Twitter. Send your comments to me at Wrestling Journo. So it's not Wrestling Journal, it's Wrestling Journo. That will come up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. So you can write that down and then send in your comments. You'll see us with the branding. You'll know us because of everything I talk about online. It's all related to these shows and what we do. So join the conversation, get involved, and let's actually talk it through. As long as you're respectful. That's the one thing I always say. Be respectful. We can disagree. It's okay. Nobody's going to die if we disagree. Let's just talk, have a good conversation. As wrestling fans, let's actually try and make the internet wrestling community a little bit more of a pleasant place to be able to disagree and have thoughts. So let's move on then to the wrestling review now. This is the next wrestler. I revealed it last week. I haven't really said his name yet, and I've done that on purpose just to sort of keep away from having to announce who it is until this point so I can do a little bit of a promo on him. This is the former world tag team champion. The Pro Wrestling Illustrated Wrestler of the Year for 2009. The future Hall of Famer. The nine-time WWE Champion. The Evolution member. None other than the Viper, Randy Orton. So before we go into the stats, before we deep dive into the different areas of Randy Orton as a wrestler, let's go through three matches that I watched to review and to help me sort of decide what I was going to give him and how I was going to rate Randy Orton. Every time I have a wrestler that I review, I Google the three greatest matches of said wrestler's career. So in this case, it was Randy Orton. And then basically, I just pick and choose the ones that I think would be worth watching based on other people's reviews. And the three that I came out with, there were... The good thing about the wrestlers like Randy Orton are there are plenty of matches to choose from. But I decided to go with the following three. From Vengeance 2004 versus Edge for the Intercontinental title. There was a match ECW One Night Stand in 2006 versus Kurt Angle. And the final match that I chose was Over the Limit 2011 versus Christian for the World Heavyweight Championship. Each of these matches were equally phenomenal. I really enjoyed them. Great, great matches to watch. I gave all of them a score of 8 out of 10. The rating is 8 out of 10 for all three, but that does not mean that they're the same. Each one was uniquely different, and I'll explain that as we go through each one. But I really loved the variety and durability of Randy Orton and his body of work as I watched these matches. I couldn't help but see... Just the, the small nuances. There were things that he did the same, which I picked up on. Some moves that I didn't realize he did so much, but there were so many things about Randy Orton's character that just small changes in the psychology in each match. Small changes in the way that he wrestled in each match. The style of wrestling that was used or the style of fighting in some cases. The speed, the tempo, everything was just slightly different in each match and it made each one feel very unique, even though they were equally as entertaining. So let's start with Vengeance 2004 versus Edge for the Intercontinental title. The first thing was that Randy Orton drips attitude, even at a young age, he looked assured and confident. I remember him, the way that he walked to the ring, just the little grimace on his face. He had this little smirk that you just wanted to slap. He was really good. He was a natural heel. And you always saw that with Randy Orton. He just had this way about him of getting under your skin. And he drips this great charisma and attitude without talking. And that's something we'll go to when I talk about his mic skills later in the review. Orton had the crowd behind him. That was something that surprised me because I wasn't sure. I didn't watch too much wrestling from about 2003 until 2017, 18. That was a period for me where I just lost interest in wrestling, uh, the modern product. I still loved wrestling. I just watched a lot of old stuff. I would consume my life watching older stuff. So I didn't really know 
about these matches. I think today was the first time that I actually watched a couple of these matches. And Randy Orton I never knew in this period. I knew him from Evolution. I stopped watching wrestling around that time when Evolution disbanded or broke up, whatever you want to say. So this match was lost on me. I I hadn't seen it before. And so I didn't actually know if Orton was a face or a heel in this match. I didn't know if either of them, who was the heel and who was the face, because the crowd were cheering for both at different times. They Then they were booing Edge, and then they would boo Orton, and then they would che- you would hear specifically Orton chants, positive Orton chants. So I was a bit confused as to who was the face and who was the heel in this match. Not that that was a problem. It was just a note that I made when I was watching at the beginning of the match. They started with the lock-up, the headlocks, side headlocks, off the ropes, leaps, jumps, falls, going out of the ring to just stall for time. All of the normal things you would expect to see from a traditional wrestling match. Uh, Randy oozes psychology, sells every little move. When I was watching the, the first match, I just noticed that no matter what Edge did, Randy Orton sold it. And one of the things I picked up after watching all three of these matches, and I'm sure I'm going to repeat this point in other match reviews, is just how much Randy Orton would go to town for his opponent. He would sell. And obviously this is part of working with Ric Flair. I've got no doubt that Ric Flair would have taught him this while they were in Evolution, that getting other wrestlers over is equally, if not more important, than you being over all the time and always winning. And that was something that was just really good that I felt Randy Orton picked up well. He always sold, and still does to this day, always sells his opponent's moves and makes them feel like they're legitimately credible and powerful moves. Fans didn't like the crisscrossing spot in the ring. There's a moment where the two of them do like the ultimate warrior Hulk Hogan crisscross in the ring. Just didn't work for them. I I don't think they were the right personalities to do this. Hogan and Warrior were these larger-than-life superheroes. So when they're running around the ring, their charisma was so high at that moment. And let's not forget, I'm comparing a world title match to an IC title match as well. In the world title match, people were just going crazy because it was Warrior and Hogan. And they supported both of them. And I can see that might be why they did this spot, was they were thinking, the crowd like Orton, they like Edge equally. So maybe if they do the crisscross spot, people will be left on edge. Who's going to get the advantage from this? But it just didn't go down well. There was booing at that point. It was clear that the fans didn't like that spot. I'm not a fan of it myself because it really doesn't make sense why you would continue to run around the ring, crossing the ropes, crossing your opponent, when you could literally just stop in the middle of the ring or just run straight to your opponent and hit them. So I didn't like it. And the crowd didn't at the time either. Uh, It was a typical Orton start. It was slow, methodical, telling a story slowly, allowing fans the time to grow interested in the match. This was a quiet match at the beginning. I noticed that the crowd didn't really seem invested. Even on the entrances, there 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 were Orton chants, there were Edge chants, there was a bit of booing for both as well. But they just weren't really into it. It didn't feel like the crowd loved the match. But that all changes. Uh, Because the match is a slower pace, even a spot of throwing Edge over the top rope has meaning and power. This is definitely a positive for Randy Orton. Because of the slowness, and this is something I think is missing from modern wrestling today. It's something I never see, actually. Just very rare to see it. Where wrestlers start a match slowly on purpose with the intent of building a story and meaning into the match. And the way that you, in my opinion as a fan, the way that you build a story is you show and demonstrate a struggle between two wrestlers. You show me that these two wrestlers truly want to beat each other, but you also show me that they're trying their hardest to do that. And then there's this frustration built when neither of them can gain a distinct advantage over the other. And when you have that moment where you've got two wrestlers who are just fighting tooth and nail to win, but they neither of them can get that edge. What you find is that every move has significance. 
every single move starts to mean something and you realize as a fan, okay, this is what's going on. And it gives you the slowness and the tempo slowdown. It gives the fan, the t it certainly gives me the time to watch it and understand, okay, they're telling me here that this is a match I need to watch because these two guys are dead even. This is going to be a tough competitive match. And that's the story that's being told in my head. Not from anything that the wrestlers say. This is all ring psychology and the moves that they perform in the ring. And Randy Orton was great at it. Edge is good at it as well. Randy was really great at making silly, not silly moves, but he was really great at making trivial wrestling moves look meaningful. And that's what I loved about watching this body of work for Randy Orton. And throwing Edge over the top rope, yes, in the 80s, that probably would have got a big pop. But during the early 2000s, this thing had been long gone. People didn't really care for this. And yet, when Randy Orton threw Edge over the top rope, it was the first time that Randy Orton gained a distinct advantage over Edge in the match. And because of that, all of a sudden you realise, oh wow, things are moving on. We're picking up the story now. And so this really, for me, was the start point in the match where things began to pick up. Biting Edge's hand during a headlock was genius. I couldn't stop laughing when I saw that. Even the look on Randy Orton's face as he's biting Edge's... Edge is just trying to put his hand on Randy's face to stop Randy doing the headlock. He's trying to, like, distract him. And to see Randy Orton just, like, gnawing away, trying to bite Edge's fingers was just... It was funny to watch. It was just a really good added point. And it also reinforced how much Randy Orton wanted to win. He wasn't going to allow any distractions that Edge might want to throw his way. This was a competitive match, and he was willing to do things that were not morally right. I'm not going to say break the rules, because while biting is not seen as a legal move in wrestling, it wasn't something you would necessarily be disqualified for unless it was savage biting. But just nabbing away at a wrestler's hand while he's in a headlock, that was just really funny and a great little spot that Orton added. Uh, it felt like a struggle. Every move has meaning. Again, I, I said that earlier, so I won't go into that one again. At this point, I said the match is a little too long for a mid-card match. But I thought about it, and I realized that this was probably a test match to see if these two guys could go as main eventers in the future. Now, yes, some of you are going to say, yeah, but Randy Orton was big already, so was Edge. They'd already proven they could do this, but... As single wrestlers, not wrestling against legends, not wrestling in a TLC match. This was a traditional wrestling match for the IC title. And so, for me, it felt and came across like WE are giving them the platform to see if they're good enough to jump to the next level. They both did it. They did a great job in this match. But the match was too long for an Intercontinental title match. That was the only criticism I had. It was two or three minutes too long, maybe five minutes at a push, but it was just a little bit too long. And as I was thinking that, what was great was that the match pace began to change and you could see that all of a sudden they were building towards the end. So there was a great sell when the turnbuckle came off, the ref having to decide to pin or replace the pad. I really love that moment because logic to me is really important in wrestling. For me to believe what's happening in the ring and the story that you're telling you have to give me a story that makes sense. And quite frankly, most modern day wrestling, the story just doesn't make sense. While some of the spots make sense and the competitive idea of wanting to win makes sense, how you win and the story that you tell to get there often goes in so many different directions that you often lose focus and get distracted. And before you know it as a fan, you're disengaged, you don't care and you've lost all the meaning. This match was the opposite to that. It was a great storytelling match. It made me believe in what I was watching and it didn't insult my intelligence. It made sense. So when the turnbuckle was pulled off by Randy Orton, the referee tried to put the turnbuckle back on because obviously he didn't want anybody gaining an illegal advantage using the turnbuckle. But what happened while the ref was about to put the turnbuckle pad back on, there was a pinfall from Edge on... Randy Orton behind him. So as the ref turns around and sees this, he has a decision to make morally. 
do I continue to put the turnbuckle pad on and ignore the match? Or do I do what I'm paid to do as a referee? Do I give the pinfall, do my job in the ring, and I'm just going to have to leave the pad? And this moment, it was really well played by the ref because he sold that well. He genuinely looked like he was making that decision between the turnbuckle or the match, my job or my moral, ethical responsibility. So it was a really good moment for me. And it's something that I don't remember seeing much in wrestling matches as well. See the turnbuckle pad come off all the time, but to see the referee fighting with it internally, making a decision, a moral versus a professional decision, it was a great thing for me to see. And I really appreciated that spot. As the match is concluding, there's a great buildup of pace, Crowder into it. It was shortly after this moment that the crowd really connected with the match. And all of a sudden, there was one moment where the crowd just popped for one of the moves that happened. I think it was a near fall. And it was like, wow, the crowd are actually really into this now. And it just went from sort of cruising at 40 mile an hour to 80 mile an hour, blasting down the, the highway. So the match tempo picked up. You could tell that they were going home. Everything was building to a nice conclusion. There was a great dodge from the spear by Randy Orton. I loved it. The way that Randy Orton sneakily gets out, slyly gets out of moves, it plays perfectly into the Viper character. It's just this slippery snake that can get out of all of these crazy little scenarios and especially finishes. Randy Orton's really good at just sneaking out of those finishes and that you really hate him for it. Even when he's a heel, you kind of want him to get the finisher on him just so that he can have the move knocked on to him but he got out of the spear a couple of times and it was just really good to watch and then again really good finish I'm not going to give away what happens in the finish in case you've never seen the match you can go back and watch that at your own leisure but it was a really really good finish to the match it went home well they didn't overstay their welcome for the finish even though the match was a little bit too long for me it was a great great match to watch had the match have been two to three minutes shorter this would have got a 9 out of 10. This, to me, was the best of the three matches. But because of that, just getting a little bit bored and stale, that was the reason I gave it an 8 out of 10 rather than a 9. Okay, so the next match is One Night Stand ECW 2006 versus Kurt Angle. The Legend of Milk against the Viper. This was a weird pay-per-view, but it all made sense once I'd started watching it properly. At first I was like, why are these two guys fighting in an ECW pay-per-view? Like, it, why? Why do that? This is ECW. Let ECW boys get in there. But I also remembered Angle had technically been in ECW previously, back in like 96. Before he went to WF, he did turn up to ECW. They did feature him on one of the episodes, but the problem was there was a, a religious moment where... I think it's Raven or Sandman was crucified on a cross. Kurt Angle was really offended by it and then said, I'm not going to have anything to do with this company and then went to WF. So technically Angle was in ECW. So that one I was like, okay, that's fine. And then I realized Randy Orton's representing WE. That's why they've put him in this match. You've got the ECW representative versus WE and therefore the crowd absolutely hate him. Great heat, Randy getting crowd hate was really fun to watch. I love when crowds are so mad at a wrestler that they are willing to physically try and push them or touch them to get their attention so that they can badmouth them. And that's what happened with Randy Orton. There was a kid on the front row, awkward moment where it looked like his dad was behind him. His dad's sort of like some watching language. Don't say anything too rude to the guy, but you can tell him that you don't like him. Randy turns around, takes it really well. I think he probably gives him something back as well for his trouble. But it's just fun watching it. And I loved, that was one of the things I loved in WCW in its peak. The way that the crowd would get heat on the wrestlers was phenomenal. There was, it just adds to the atmosphere of what's going on. And you, as a fan watching from the TV screen, you really buy into the momentum that's being built in this match or in this event. Because you realise how much it means to the normal average person who's paid for a ticket. Wrestlers, we know, are going to hype matches because they're paid to do it. It's their profession, right? But when fans pay and they hate people so much, 
There's nothing better than that as a fan because you just buy into it. You're like, I'm sold on this. The fans love it. The wrestlers love it. I love it. And it just feels like this whole holistic moment where you, you're all just in unison on this love of wrestling. So it's always great seeing that. It was a high-octane start, really technical match. Kurt Angle getting the better of Randy Orton all the way through the beginning. You've got to watch it. It's just really good the way that Kurt Angle sells everything. And the way that Randy Orton just plays up to being this WE guy that everybody hates. He does a great job of selling it all. A real coward, getting out of everything. Just brilliant to watch. Selling the story brilliantly is what I put next. Orton getting owned, clearly not as good as Angle, but still finding a way to get an advantage. This was where he moved out the way in the corner and Angle goes straight shoulder first into the, the ring post. The way that Randy Orton sneaks out of situations is, to me, an absolute gem of a wrestling move. Something that he makes his own as a wrestling character. And this is where I'll talk about charisma later when we go through the ratings but this is where it really comes to the fore randy orton really sells getting out of moves and he makes it his own little thing where you know that it's a randy orton thing that's happening it this he's making it his own and that to me is the sign of somebody who's an incredibly gifted wrestler somebody who can make a normal thing very unique and feel like it's something that they have created or invented. Just a brilliant little thing. Orton, more biting. Tremendous. Love it when I see him biting people. I never noticed... Maybe I've just not watched enough Randy Orton matches, but I didn't realise biting was such a big deal to him. He does it in all his matches. I didn't realise that biting was such a big deal to Randy Orton. He actually did it in all of the matches that I reviewed. Not many better drop kicks than Orton's. That was another, just a random note that I saw. I love Randy Orton drop kicks. He just, there are a few wrestlers in the business who can drop kick and you look at it and it just looks like a thing of masterful beauty and you, you just have to admire it. And Randy Orton's standing drop kicks are phenomenal. For a guy who's like 6'4", the way his agility is phenomenal. Next level agility. Orton lives the snake gimmick, getting out of so many finishes and big moves. I've talked about that already. Great noises on the moves, shows real co contact. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you've got to watch this match. You literally hear skin slapping skin when they're hitting moves. And the crowd, and this is an ECW crowd. This isn't like your normal WE, happy clappy family friendly tittle tattle. This is real ECW hardcore fans who appreciate real contact they appreciate that and you could hear it in the match and I loved it there was no slapping knees it was literally them allowing and using their bodies to make natural noise to emphasize the contact and the physicality of the match and it was brilliant there was one spot in particular where Randy Orton comes off the top rope it's like a cross body and you just hear the slap it's like and you hear it and you can hear the gasp from the audience. And I gasped because I was like, whoa, you don't hear that very often in wrestling. You don't tend to hear it unless it looks forced or fake. This didn't and it looked great. It sounded brilliant. The match ends with a really good finish. <laughs> I felt like I was going to make another point after that. But it was just my notes just say good finish. So again, it was a really good finish. They didn't waste time. What The other thing I hate about modern wrestling is the way that everybody does finishing moves 200,000 times before they finish the match. Ridiculous. At this point in time, Randy Orton would try the RKO, but it would always, always fall through. And if somebody kicked out, it would be rare. That was the other thing I noticed from the, from the free matches that I watched, and from that era as well. People actually respected finishing moves. And there's nothing wrong with trying to do a finishing move 10 or 15 times. As long as you only connect once or twice. Because if you connect every time and it doesn't do damage significantly enough to win the match. Or at least get a near fall. I'm not interested. I don't care. And nowadays it's like near fall after near fall. And you just lose interest because you realise their finishing moves mean nothing. They're not doing any damage. So I love that. And I the same with Kurt, uh, Kurt Angle. The same goes for him, like, he tried to do the angle slam multiple times, he got the ankle lock a couple of times, but Randy Orton 
got to the ropes. That's the good thing about submission moves as finishers. You can always legitimize how somebody can escape them because they can get to the ropes or they can reverse the move. It's difficult with... There's just more options with submission moves, in my opinion. And you can legitimize a submission move a lot more easily because of the pain and the fight and the competitive nature of the person who's on the receiving end of it, where they're try- like Stone Cold when he was trying to fight out of the sharpshooter at WrestleMania 13. You can tell such a powerful story from a submission move. It's a great... For me, it's a lost art submission move wrestling where you actually tell a story through submission moves. I think modern wrestling fans don't like wrestlers on the mat doing wrestling things. And that's such a shame because we need more of it. Okay, so the final match before we go into the main review. Over the Limit 2011 versus Christian. This one I've got the least amount of notes. Probably because at this point I knew that I'd already written notes that would simply just repeat things I've already said. But Orton here is in his peak condition. If you want to see how I've rated Randy Orton's physique and you need evidence to justify the score I'm going to give him for this, look at this match. Look at 2011. Randy Orton is in the shape of his life. He's always been in great shape, but there's something about 2011 when I looked at him and I was like, geez, I would not want to get in the ring with that dude. He just looks jacked. Unbelievable. Peak condition, Randy Orton. Randy Orton has incredible agility. When you think of the name The Viper and you compare the way that a snake is, they're arguably the most agile creatures on Earth. No bone structure, they just slither, they can fit in and around objects and they just move so smoothly wherever they want to go. And Randy Orton epitomizes that. He is the personification of the Viper, and what I love is the way that Randy is able to slither his way out of any situation in any given match at any given time, and it's something that he's continued to do throughout his career. I don't think he's ever stopped doing that, and I really appreciate the build-up and the tension that that adds to every match, and I think that's why people love RKO out of nowhere kind of thing. It just builds that tension of you never know when it's coming but you know it's going to happen and when you think that about a wrestler you naturally want to watch them in modern wrestling nowadays you hear a lot of the AEW fans a lot of fans in wrestling complaining about slow methodical rational matches they just don't like it they call it boring I've heard plenty of people nowadays calling even the Bret Hart Shawn Michaels Iron Man match boring because it's too slow, it's too lethargic, they're wasting their time instead of doing fun stuff that we can all watch and enjoy. And actually, there's an irony here because it also applies to Randy Orton. I hear a lot of fans saying that Randy's not a very good wrestler anymore, he's slow and boring, blah, 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 blah. blah. But the irony, I think, is that you always are left wanting more when you watch a Randy Orton match. And he does that on purpose. He wants you to go away from it as a fan, always wanting to see more of the stuff that you like. And I believe that he intentionally holds back knowing that that's what people want to see. And so he gives you enough of it that it makes you satisfied when you see it, but also it keeps you demanding more. And I think that is a brilliant way to be able to control the emotion of the fan And to know that, okay, they're going to want more here. They're going to want to see me do these more of these fast moves. Well, I'm going to hold back. Instead of doing more of the flippy stuff, like all these modern wrestlers seem to do nowadays, Randy Orton is still going against the grain. This is part of his rebellious nature that I've talked about before. He's going against the grain saying, no, I'm going to pull back on all of the agility stuff. And I'm going to do it in a very limited capacity. So that when you're watching me, You're not going to know when it's coming, but you'll know it's there. And when you see it, you'll appreciate it and it'll leave you wanting more. And I think that's a really intelligent psychology that Randy Orton brings to every match that he's in. And also with the way that he utilizes this incredible and insane amount of agility that he has. More biting from Randy in this one. Again, he's bitten somebody in every match, whether it's Kurt Angle or Edge or Christian. 
just really like it. It breaks the match up. It adds a little bit of like nasty comedy to it. When you're watching those slow holds in the middle of the ring, whether it's a headlock or a side headlock, chin lock, whatever it is, people do get bored in those moments. But to add those little moments in where you're biting, where you're doing something illegal, you're trying to get out of the move in a way that's not really acceptable, it just keeps your attention as a fan. You know that you have to watch because you don't want to miss something like that. So again, it's another really clever way that Randy can slow down the match pace. They can get into a position where they're resting and they're setting up the next moves and etc, etc. But it just keeps the fan wanting to watch and engaging instead of turning off for those few seconds. This was definitely the fastest pace of the three matches. It's good to see the switch up because I mentioned this before. There is a big variety in, in the three that I reviewed. Each one is unique. Each one is different. Each one has its own pace. It has its own tempo. It has its own style. And I really love the way that Randy Orton seems to adjust to every opponent that he fights. Whoever he's performing with, there always seems to be a unique resonance of Randy Orton saying, I'm going to make this match different from any of the others that I've had before. I'm going to make this match special, unique. It's going to have stuff that you may have seen it before, but it's going to be done in a slightly different way. And when I reviewed Kevin Nash last week, I also talked about similarities in that, that Kevin Nash would take similar spots, throwing people off of the ring into the table on the outside of the ring as a spot, and he would change it each time to make it a little bit different. And that just plays into this theory of, keeping a match spontaneous, always keeping the fans on the edge of their seat, not knowing quite what's going to happen, even when they can sense what's going to happen. It's a great way of just keeping focus. So I loved the fast pace in all in this match and how it was different to the other two. Again, just really good variety. It's great to see that. It's great to experience it as a fan to watch somebody's work and see that they can work in different styles, levels up your appreciation and respect of the performer. Orton's the consummate professional, always sells for his opponents to legitimise the match. I could pick on specific moves, but it would just get boring because I would pick on every single move. That's how meticulous Randy Orton is when it comes to displaying pain and suffering in the moves that his opponents give him. And I love that. I think it's really respectful from Randy Orton to do it. It's a, a trait that the very best wrestlers are always remembered for. Bret Hart is talked about so lovingly by former opponents because he not only does moves and is safe to work with, but he allows his opponents time and space to sell. He allows his opponents that opportunity to look overpowered, stronger, like they're winning. He sells for them. And Ric Flair is the same. And the best sellers in the business are always remembered for that. And I think Randy Orton does it a lot as well for his opponents. Whether he's going to be remembered in the same way or not uh, remains to be seen. But hopefully he will because he does a tremendous job with every opponent that he fights with. The next bit that I loved was a variant of the Boston Crab. I mean, at least that's what I would call it. And literally the comment that I've written is, wow, wow. I saw this, it's like a reverse Boston Crab, where on a normal Boston Crab, the wrestler who's applying the hold will sit down, almost like a sharpshooter position. The legs are tucked around the front of the wrestler's body, underneath the arms, and then the wrestler pulls back, sits down on the lower back of the opponent, and that causes pain. This was like the opposite. Randy Orton was standing up. He was actually standing up over Christian, Christian's face was facing the ground and Randy basically picks Christian up into a Boston Crab. But instead of him being sitting down and pulling back on the legs, he's actually standing over him and he's pulling the legs forward and using his body for momentum to hurt the back and arch the back of Christian. It looked really good. It was a bit weird at first because it was new. And when I first saw it, I was like, what is he trying to do? Is this an actual move? And then once he stopped and locked it in, 
then it just seemed to become, and you could hear the fans as well, the fans reacted in the same sort of way. Once they realised, oh, he's going with this, whether it was a mistake or whether it's a legit movie he's trying to do, they just bought it and went with it. And eventually it, the fans started supporting it. And that's the beauty, I think, of new things. When you do a new move, something that people haven't seen before, they don't know how to react. And I, again, this is something that I think is great from Randy Orton's from a psychology standpoint. When you look at spontaneity, when you look at the idea of variance and keeping the viewer guessing at what's coming, when you can do things that they haven't seen before, they do not know how to react because it takes a few moments for their brain to adjust to what they're seeing. And how great is that for fans to be caught off guard? There's nothing better when you're, and, and this goes for me, I was caught off guard. There's no better feeling because you appreciate the wrestler and what he's doing even more for actually outsmarting you. I always love Randy's RKO build-up. Just really cool. You know that he's mad. You know that he's getting to that point mentally where he's ready to do the move and he feels like he's got his opponent set up to do it that's great to watch and again a great finish to the match just really simple good finish to the match and that obviously built to another match with Christian I believe he had three matches with Christian and this was like one of the biggest I I never watched wrestling at this point but I do remember reading about the Orton Christian storyline this year in 2011 I remember seeing it People were saying how great it was. It was like the rivalry of the year kind of thing. So I did want to watch it at the time. I'm glad that I've watched it. I'll probably go back and watch the other two matches now because it felt like a middle match of a trilogy. And I'm not sure if it was. It was just fun to watch. Really good match. I'm not a big fan of Christian, but this was a really good match. And Christian entertained me, sold me on it. I believed it. I think Christian's a little bit weak looking. Compared to, especially compared to Randy Orton, who's 6'4". Christian really managed to make himself believable in this match. I loved the way that he sold the spear moment and he was just trying to really rev it up as, you know, this is a tribute to Edge, my best friend. It, just really good moments like that. So I want to give Christian a bit of credit there as well, considering that's a wrestler that I don't necessarily like as much as, uh, as other guys. So those are the three matches that we've reviewed. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you want to watch them, go on the network. Like I said, Vengeance 2004, One Night Stand ECW 2006, Over the Limit 2011. Go and watch those matches. They're a lot of fun. And if you watch them back to back, it's really entertaining. So my final part here, I want to just give an honorable mention to a 2008 promo. You, if you just YouTube Randy Orton's best promo, you'll get one that's talking about him and Batista back in 2008. It's a really good promo. You should watch that as well. And I will refer to the reasons why I like that promo in a moment. Okay, so we're going to go into the main section of the show now. We are going to review Randy Orton in all of the main areas in his wrestling persona. And we're going to give him a overall rating at the end. And then finally, we will finish the review with the overall ranking of Randy Orton on the greatest of all time wrestlers list. Let's have a look at the different areas of Randy Orton's persona. We've got the character. Now, we start with character. I've explained in previous episodes what I mean. If you want to know the ins and outs of the meanings behind all of these areas, please go back, have a look at the introduction episode. It's a heck of a long episode, but I go into the detail of what I mean behind each of these areas of a wrestler's persona. I don't want to explain it every week because it just adds loads of time onto the podcast and it, I don't want to repeat myself all the time. So go and have a watch of that and get all of the information, get all the know-how so that you understand when I review these wrestlers what I'm talking about. But for character out of 22, I have given Randy Orton 20. The reason I haven't given him a 22, I'm going to explain something that I didn't explain in the introduction episode, and I'm not repeating myself on this bit. When you're 20 out of 22, that's when you hit like the elite level. So anyone who scores 20, 21 or 22, they are considered in the elite category for that section. So for example, for Randy Orton, I believe he's in the elite character section of wrestlers where he has a character that has got over. 
He's done something significant in the industry. And that's what separates him from other people who just aren't quite seen as that elite. A 21 out of 22 would be another step up from the elite wrestler. It would be someone who has managed to get their character to a place where it's unique, but it's not quite considered one of the greatest characters of all time. It's like, it's just one level away. And then, of course, a 22 out of 22 for character would be someone like Ric Flair, who has this character that you can believe, get behind. He lives and breathes the character. You are fully invested in, in it as a fan, whether it's hating him or loving him. There's just always this constant investment in that character, and he sells it right. And Randy Orton's a 20. He... He just misses out really on those two things and this is something that I wanted to bring up in the review specifically about Randy Orton and it's a very simple but powerful statement. Randy Orton is potentially the greatest wrestler of all time. I know that's a controversial thing to say and I know there's going to be a lot of people who are like what on earth are you watching to say that? There's just something there that lets you know he hasn't reached his full potential yet. There's something hidden deep beneath the surface that if he could just reach in and go there, he would easily be as big as Ric Flair. He would easily be as big as Shawn Michaels. He'd easily be as big as Stone Cold. He'd easily be as big as The Rock. And maybe that's unbelievable for some people. And I'll explain that as we go through this review on on why I feel this way. But I needed to just say that, that Randy Orton to me... There's just something about his character that is off at the moment. I'm not sure what it is. I thought about it this week as I was obviously thinking about this review. The only thing I can get down to is the fact that Randy Orton is content. And he's landed in this place in WE where he is comfortable. Almost to the point where it's detrimental to his character. It happens a lot to wrestlers, especially now that there's no competition. And... Yes, I know there's AEW, but it's not really real competition yet. Until AEW are getting the same ratings as SmackDown and Raw, it's not competition. It's not something that's going to push Randy Orton, a top major talent within WE, to do better, to do more, to push himself to new limits. Randy Orton has the ability to be the best wrestler of all time. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And the character area is a is a great starting point to talk about this because while the Viper character is good and it certainly elevates him to an elite level it certainly takes him to a plane where as a fan you know that he's a legitimate badass you know that okay he's legitimate he's going to be in the top two or three wrestlers in the company while he's here okay you're legitimized it's fine the problem that I have with Randy Orton's character is is that he doesn't push further So that instead of you being comfortable with him being in the top two or three wrestlers, he should be pushing the envelope where he is the top wrestler to ever exist, period. And he doesn't do that enough for me. Maybe he's just too respectful of people who've been in the past. But for me, if he were to take his character and say, I'm the best there's ever been. And I know some people will go back to, he said this when he was the legend killer. The problem with that is, when he was the legend killer, he was still green to the business. He was still learning. There was still a lot of imperfections. Now that he's had the career he has had, now he's at this point where physically he's still got a lot in the tank. There's still loads that he can do. This is the time where Randy Orton should legitimately be saying, I'm the best in the business. And I'm fed up of being this guy who is told to sell for jobbers. And he should use these words. He needs to have a go at WE on the microphone, get him in front of the audience. Not that there's a live audience at the moment, but get him in front of the camera and let him talk about frustrations. He should run off all of his list of achievements. He should say, I've won the nine, I'm the nine time WE champion. I know I'm going to be a future Hall of Famer. I know that I'm going to have everything I want in this business, but that's not enough. You know, Randy Orton has this rebellious side, and I think that that matches very closely to the Stone Cold Steve Austin character. And for some reason, maybe it's because he just doesn't want to copy Stone Cold or whatever. I need to see more of that. I need to see him draw more into that character and be more of a 
I'm going to push against the authority and what they're telling me to do. Do you know what I'd love Randy Orton to do? I would love WE to set him up in matches against, you know, good wrestlers. I'm not, I don't want to disrespect them. They're good wrestlers. But what I want to see Randy do is refuse to wrestle, stand on the outside of the ring, take a 10 count and lose, lose on purpose and tell us, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm not going to give you these petty little jobbers and I'm not going to give my time, my excellence, who I am over to crap like this. At this point, there's a part of a promo, if I were writing the, the script for Orton, if I were to direct him, if you like, I would be saying to Randy Orton, you need to go out there and say, if you're the standard bearer for the main event in WE, if people have to beat you to get to the main event of WE, then you're fed up of that bar being lowered instead of raised. And until WE start raising the bar and pushing... Randy to do more and things that he's never done before until they really start actually giving him what he needs he's going to refuse to work I would take Randy Orton away from screen time I would give him screen time but not let him wrestle I would intentionally let him go out to the ring and I would let him take 10 counts and just walk off and just be like I'm not wrestling I don't need to wrestle this guy he's hopeless and it sounds bad because he's putting current wrestlers down, but if Randy Orton's not fighting Drew McIntyre, I'm not interested. Because Drew McIntyre is a legitimate WE champion who I want to see wrestle Randy Orton. And I love the fact that they've put Randy with Drew, but there's a feeling WE are using him. They're using his talents to get everybody else over. And they do this with so many wrestlers. They do it with Dolph Ziggler. They've done it with people like Bobby Roode's another guy that I wish would just be given an opportunity in the business. Like, give the guy a chance. But with Randy Orton's character, the only way this expands or gets better now is if he goes against the authority of the WE. He refuses to do matches because he's told to and starts making more demands of, I want to be better than my potential. I'm fed up of being told my whole life that I had the potential to be the best wrestler of all time. This is when that stops. This is when the potential stops and the future begins. And I am going to be the best wrestler of all time. I am going to earn the title of the greatest wrestler of all time. How am I going to do that? I am not going to be wrestling anybody who's not good enough to be in a ring with me anymore. And he should refuse. That should be his character. Is he going to wrestle tonight? And what that does is when he wrestles... It really elevates the person he's fighting against. If he wrestles Seth Rollins, it raises the level. People understand, okay, Randy Orton respects Seth. He's fighting him. Same with Dolph Ziggler. And so we should get loads of these wrestlers in who are actually really good to work with, but also good characters and good wrestlers that work specifically with Randy Orton. And what I would do is, is I would get away from this idea of Randy just wrestling people to pull them into the main event scene. And I would make Randy the center of that story. This is about Randy Orton wanting to be seen and recognized as the best wrestler of all time. And I would make him mad. I would make him an angry guy, bitter at the company. I would turn that rebellious nature that he has, I would fuel that into the fire as well. I just don't see it at the moment. The Viper thing is like, it's all too forced. That's really how the whole gimmick feels at the moment. It feels like a gimmick. And I want to see the real Randy Orton come out. And that's the part of his character for me that needs to be elevated. If he could do that, I think that we're going to see a better Randy Orton than we've ever seen before. I think we'll see him take more care and add more passion into his matches and into his work which therefore would also elevate everything he does anyway. And it would also challenge the people he's wrestling with. This guy's saying he's the best wrestler in the business. Now, if he's saying that, I've got to outperform him to prove that I'm better. And so you start pulling in all the other wrestlers and saying, if you're wrestling me, then you better think that you're the best in the world because this is what we're going to have to tell when we tell these stories. We're going to have to have great matches. We're going to have to go for it. It's going to be competitive. It's going to be violent at times. And I would get away a little bit from the... I don't mind the way that he builds up for the RKO. That's fine. He can still do all that stuff. But the multiple personality disorder stuff, get away from that. That's stupid. It doesn't make sense. He would literally be on tablets and pills in real life if he had that issue. So 
that to me doesn't make any sense at all and i would stay away from that the next rating is physique randy orton gets 22 out of 22 for physique four marks for the jacked up randy orton it's not just about his looks i've mentioned this on previous episodes it's not just muscle mass that gives you the rating scores in this review it's more than that it's about how does he work this is a guy that has been in the business for a very long time now and he's consistently been there of course he's had the odd injury we know that he's had to leave every now and then and I think that's normal for wrestlers to get injuries that last six to twelve months like it's gonna happen at least once in most wrestlers careers unless they're ultra careful about what they're doing and Randy Orton hasn't been, I, would, I wouldn't consider him injury prone. He's been on our screens more than he's been off of our screens. And that's a real testament to the body of work that Randy Orton has. He's a very safe worker, but he's also safe in terms of what he does for himself. He doesn't overstretch himself to the point where he's going to get injured. And part of that, I think, comes because he's comfortable. This extends back to the character thing. I think I'd love to see him push further physically to show that he is the best or at least one of the best wrestlers in the world. But from a physique standpoint, this is a guy who could easily do an Ironman match. He works the same way as Bret and Shawn Michaels. So he could easily pull off an Ironman match. I'd love to see him do that. I know a lot of people wouldn't, but I would love to see him in a a sort of one to zero Iron Man match with someone like Drew McIntyre or Seth Rollins. I think those those two matches could really work because you would have Seth where it would be Seth sort of wriggles out somehow resiliency builds up he can just somehow kick out of everything and then eventually either he would finally get the RKO and get a victory over Seth or Seth would wriggle out of an RKO attempt nail his finishing move and he would steal the win in the Iron Match. That's the way I would book it. For Drew McIntyre, it would be similar, but it would be more competitive. It would be more, these are two guys are just tooth and nail going at it. They're very close to each other. They're just both powerful beings who know how to wrestle. And it would just be this clash of really good wrestlers and power and strength coming face to face against each other. And so I would make it like a one to zero victory in whichever way the company wanted it to go so physique wise randy orton 22 out of 22 he's got the height he's got the build he's believable he can go he doesn't blow up he works at the right pace for someone his size but he can also switch up the pace when he needs to he has everything when it comes to physique so for me randy orton has got the perfect wrestling physique the next area is mike skills and for mike skills i've given randy orton 20 out of 22. I've talked in the past about how mic skills are not only having a microphone in your hand, but it's about the way you communicate who you are in the ring and outside of the ring without the microphone. And I've talked about it in the reviews when I talked about how he oozes charisma when he walks to the ring, he's got this swagger about him. That is all communicating something to the audience. That's telling us something without using words. That charisma that he has that ability to get over is why he's in an elite category when it comes to mic skills this is a dude who can get heat from just walking around smirking and i think that that says everything it needs to about randy orton he has like it's something i would compare to like rick rude in that sense where he can just give you a look and you hate him for it and you know immediately how you feel about him and that's just a great quality to have it's a great talent to possess I think he could be better on the mic. Uh, I've looked at some of his promo work and honestly, he can be very boring on the microphone. Even though he tries to be angry, I never quite believe that he's angry enough because Randy Orton comes across as the kind of guy who needs to swear. He comes across to me like the kind of guy who swears a lot. So when he talks and it's clean, it just doesn't cut the mustard for me. I listen to it and I don't believe it. I don't believe that Ran... I believe that he's mad and I can believe the emotion, but I don't believe him. So for Randy Orton, I think his real problem has been how can he... I've said it many times before to my friends about Randy Orton. This is a guy who, if he'd have come into the business in the late 90s, 
he would have been perfect in WCW as a real young competitive player. Some people will disagree and say there's no way he should have been subjected to WCW's booking and politics. But the point I'm making is Randy Orton's good enough that he could have saved WCW. And even if he'd have gone to WE in the Attitude Era, I think he would have learnt from the rock and stone cold and the competitive nature of all of the, the high, the top card elite talent in WE at that time. It would have pushed Randy on further than he's ever been before. We would have seen a Randy Orton that would have been able to have, the reins would have been taken off. He would have been able to talk the way he wanted to talk. He would have said things and spoken more naturally. Things that made more sense to who he is. Because you can tell with Randy Orton that it's missing something. You can tell that it's like, this isn't quite Randy Orton yet. And that's one of the reasons I think that his character is still not hitting the heights that it should hit. He's having to hold back who he is. And when a wrestler has to hold back who they are as a person, that's when you get this negative drop-off in level of ability and skill and performance. So I want to see more of that from Randy Orton. I think character and mic skills are, his, are the two areas of, of Randy Orton's persona. If he could change those, they're small changes, but they're controversial changes. And that's why I, I doubt that we'll ever see this happen. Which is such a shame because Randy Orton could literally be the best guy ever in wrestling, as far as I'm concerned. I think he's got that potential, but he just isn't allowed, or he's not allowing himself to go there and to reach those heights. Finally, we go to technique. Randy Orton, I've given 21 out of 22 for technique. I've talked about technique before. We've talked about what it means, what it is. It's not just the technical ability in the ring. It's also the way that you perform the moves. And I mentioned it in one of the reviews earlier. The way that Randy Orton does things like leapfrogs sounds so so simple but leapfrogs the way that he just ducks away from moves the way that he would weasel i'd say weasel his way out but he he's so slippery at getting out of moves especially finishes and signature moves he's made these really trivial basic elementary moves his own and they really feel like that's randy orton that i'm watching even the drop kick he's got his own drop kick and when somebody has a drop kick to me that says everything it needs to. Mr. Perfect had a great drop kick. Bret Hart had a good drop kick. But they were all unique. For some reason, the drop kick says a lot about a wrestler, in my opinion. Any wrestler that can do a drop kick well is usually a very an excellent wrestler. It's it's rare to see someone who can do a drop kick well not become a great wrestler. I don't know why that is. There's just some natural agility that when you can do a great drop kick, you're just clearly a very good wrestler. And that's, Randy Orton does that. And for a guy his size to drop kick the way that he does, is phenomenal. Just really good to watch. And Randy has those moves that you just ties to. Immediately when you you see a move, you recognize it as Randy Orton's. When I see the RKO, I mean, this is a move that even in the declining business that WE's got at the moment, from the Attitude Era to now, where wrestling popularity is continually going down. The one thing that I always see in sort of normal society is the RKO. People still love the way the RKO looks and what it is. You see it in memes all the time. It pops up. It still has that pop culture feel. And that goes to show how good Randy Orton is. So I've given him 21 out of 22 for technique. So now let's look at the... Final four categories, we've got the champion, the tag team, stable and legend categories. For champion, I give Randy Orton three stars. He earns one of those stars because he's won a minor title within wrestling, which would be the IC title, for example. The second star would be because he's won a major title, which of course would be the WE Championship. And the fact that he's won it multiple times gives him the third star. For tag team... We know that he has tag team experience. As I've said before, he has won the tag team title and he's actually won tag team titles in WE multiple times. Now, just to clarify here, he has won multiple tag titles. They were just called different things. I think he won the SmackDown tag team titles and then he won 
the tag team titles before the brand split when he was part of Evolution. So he's actually won multiple. It's just that they've changed the name of the belts, which is stupid, but that's that's WE at the moment for you. Stable, well, we all know about that. Very, very easy for him. He has stable experience. He's had a manager, and he's also headed up his own stable faction of wrestlers. So for Randy Orton, he gets three stars with the stable. And then finally, we go into the legend category, and Randy Orton again gets three stars in the legend category. The first two clearly because he's a legend now. I think everybody recognizes he's a future Hall of Famer. He's won a title. He's won one of the major belts in the business. So that gives him the second star. And then the final third star is that he's headlined one of the main events of the major promotional pay-per-views, which would be headlining WrestleManias and countless other pay-per-views that he's headlined. So with all that done, if you've been doing your maths, and I'm not talking about Scott Steiner mathematics, if you've been doing your maths through this section, you'll know that the overall rating for Randy Orton is 95 out of 100. An unbelievable score for Randy Orton there. Higher than Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash was 93 out of 100. Randy Orton's 95. So based on that, we know that he's in the top 15, but... Where is he in the overall list of the greatest wrestlers of all time? And I can announce that now by telling you that Randy Orton is indeed 12th on the list of the greatest wrestlers of all time. So not quite in the top 10, but boy was he close. He's unique because on my list, I'm looking over at my laptop now and I've got the list open. He is the top current wrestler on my list. So not only is he 12th overall, but he is at the moment to me, he is the best wrestler that is currently working in wrestling. There is somebody near to him. He's not far away. There's actually two who are still quite near. And so I think it's important just to state that Randy Orton still has time in his career to prove that he's better than I've currently rated him. I'm hoping, I have like a prayer that Randy Orton will throw the shackles off and WE will either force him to be unleashed or Randy himself will just say he'll get to a point in his career where he says I need to have that one big final run that really defines my career. I want to see it. I think fans want to see it. You know, Eric Bischoff said Randy Orton is one of the most underrated wrestlers of all time. And I agree, just underutilized, underrated. But this is a guy who has so much to offer the wrestling industry. And I really just hope that he's given that push that he needs, whether that's somebody telling him that he needs to change and do things differently. I just want somebody needs to stoke the fire within him that just motivates him to want to be the best ever. And if somebody can do that, I don't know if anybody has the capability in WE. I'm not sure. I would have thought Triple H would have been the guy to do that. But he's at this point in his career now where he's the Hall of Fame. He knows he's in the Hall of Fame. Like, he, it's guaranteed. He's got the ring. And that's so sad because he's so much more and can be so much more than he is at the moment. And he's already a great wrestler. He just... He can get to a different level if he tries. And he just needs to let loose and... Forget everything he's been called in the past. Forget the fact that you've been told that you've got the potential to be the best. And just go out there and do it. That's what I want to see from him. And, and it's nice. It's, it's always nice when you're g considering the review and you're talking about your opinion in your head of what you think of Randy Orton. And then somebody with the experience of Eric Bischoff in the industry, whether you respect him or not, comes out with this kind of statement about Randy Orton. And it's in line with everything you think so. It's always nice and reassuring to have that. And I want to see more from him. And I think my message would be, if I was going to book him, it would all be about stoking that fire. I would make, I would put Randy Orton in a scenario where he would be angry about the way he's being booked. And I would do it so that it stokes that fire within him. And I would give him a microphone and I would say, tell us, tell us how you feel. Tell everybody how angry you are that we're 
undervaluing you. Tell everybody what you think about yourself. Be arrogant, be angry, be rebellious. Make us believe in you again and make us want to watch and make us want to follow your progress for the rest of your career. Make us believe that you're the best wrestler of all time and prove it. So that's that's it for the review today. We've managed to get episode two done. We've looked at, obviously, the hot topics. We've had the review of Randy Orton, which has been a really good look into parts of his career today and all the elements that make Randy Orton who he is. Finally, now that we've talked about the rating and his ranking, we can now reveal who will be in episode three. For next week's episode, we're going to look at a wrestler that I loved growing up. He was one of my ultimate favorite wrestlers alongside... Stone Cold Steve Austin, this guy was my favourite wrestler in my teenage years growing up. I really believe that his name and reputation has been dragged through the mud. Undeservedly so, and I'll go into that in the review next week of Bill Goldberg. That's right, people. Goldberg's next in episode three. As for now, we are done with episode two. Please join the conversation online after this let me know what you think about the whole episode i'd love your feedback if you're watching on youtube make sure you leave a comment if you're watching or listening on another platform and you want to comment and get involved hashtag the wrestling journal on twitter or you can at me at wrestling journo and that's journal minus the a and the l substitute it with an o and you have wrestling journo so come and follow me And we can engage online. We can talk about your opinions of who the greatest wrestlers of all time are. You can talk about Randy Orton, whether you agree with me. You can talk about Kevin Nash, whether you agree with me. And let's have a good, respectable conversation and show people that the internet wrestling community can be a positive place where we learn to disagree respectably. So until next week, where we talk about Bill Goldberg for episode three, I'm X Harper, and you've been awesome. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you soon.